test check. Whoa. The Holy Spirit just boomed on this thing. How's everybody doing today? Faith builders, you are dismissed in Jesus' name. God is so good. Has anybody else had a busy week this week? It's been quite crazy, but you know what? It's all good. Isn't Jesus good? I know a scripture. It goes something, a little something like this. I might need your help to say it. I I can do some things. I I can do maybe all things. I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. Can I get an amen? Just another quick reminder about these FCA camps. If you'd like to send your children to them, they're for teenagers, all the way down to, I think, six. I don't know anymore. That's That one's 13 to 18. This one's ages 6 to 12. There's more information at the Information Center. If you want your kids to go for a camp for three-hour days, or if you want your teenagers out of your hair for three days, go ahead and send them to these camps. All the teenage parents said amen, and thank you, Jesus. I've been having a good time this week. I want to get real with you just real quick for just a moment. And I want to say something about serving. I want to say something about giving unto the Lord and about coming to church and being a participator instead of a spectator. Can I get an amen, church? Because the church of God did not did not, back in the book of Acts, it did not advance from people that stayed in the upper room. It did not advance because the disciples decided they wanted to have a bless me club. We got 120 people. Thank you, Jesus. We're okay. We all love each other. We're going to have a great time. And what I've seen in New England is unfortunate. But the culture that we have set in New England, that if a church is small, that's the way the church is supposed to be. There's supposed to be a tight-knit community. And I understand that is very vital and very important, but that is what our groups are for, to keep us in unity and with individuals. And I wanted to reach out to just say to everybody in this room that I want to thank every person that serves either in Revive Kids in the parking lot. Can we give it up for all of our servants, the worship team, the AV team, everybody? Because you guys make this possible. The, all the work that goes on behind the scenes before you even show up on a Sunday morning is absolutely incredible. All the people who give of their time, all of the Revive Kids uh, leaders, the ones who set everything up to the curriculum. Because can I get an amen? They're not just watching your children. They're teaching your children. Jim, can we give it up for Jim? He's absolutely awesome. Thank you very much, sir. Everybody could use a little vodka. I mean water. Thanks, Jim. You put the right stuff in it. But I want to do a call to action for anybody in this room who is not currently serving in any way, shape, or form here in Revive Church. And this is not me trying to beat you up. And this is not me trying to make you do something that you do not want to do. Because I don't want people that don't want to be here. Can I get an amen for that? Y'all don't want to hang out with people that don't want to be at your party. You won't want them there either. (laughs) And so, can you turn down the monitor just a little bit? It's kind of a little scratchy up here. But I want to have a call to action for anybody in this room. If you are not serving in any way in this church, and of course you're giving, I think everybody should give, but I also, I don't think we should just give with our money. I think we should give of our talents and our gifts. And one big thing that needs help right now, and I hate preaching, I never wanted to have to do this. I always wanted to preach and thank God for the people who he has given us, but I'm going to ask the people who are not serving, if you have time, make time to help serve out in our, in our Revive Kids. It's absolutely vital that we have people. It's absolutely vital that we, that's the most important area that we have in this church right now. It takes at least seven people every single week to be able to watch the kids and teach the kids and set everything up, keeping everything clean. But I want to encourage you if you are not, and you're thinking maybe in your mind, man, I don't want to watch anybody's kids because they're crazy. Well, so are you, but God still loves you, amen? And you're probably thinking, I work with kids all week long. Well, I can guarantee you 90% of the ladies back there and the guys back there have kids of their own that they're trying to take care of. A lot of them are teachers. A lot of them are parents. A lot of them are grandparents. And so I want to encourage you, if you're not serving in any way in this place, get connected. Get connected. Because you know what? Probably the worst thing that you said that you don't want to do, the one thing that you tell God I don't want to do, Lord, I'll do anything but sang. Lord, I'll, I'll do anything but go to Africa. Anything but Africa. I'll do anything but stand out in the cold rain. I'll do anything but watch someone else's crumb cruncher, okay? I can guarantee you that is what God wants you to do because God has a sense of humor. If I was to tell you, and I've told you everybody this at least one time or another, and I'm going to say it again, I am not naturally extroverted. I'm not. Even the last week, two weeks ago, when I went to a conference, I had the tendency to be quiet and hang around in a corner because the conference was big enough I could have hid. I could have. I don't want to talk to anybody. I just wanted to go and be fed and leave. But I made the decision that a network is not going to build itself. 
You're not going to make friends sitting in the chair that you're sitting in. Can I get an amen? And I don't want us to have a poor me victim mentality saying, well, nobody talks to me, so that way I'm not going to do anything. Well, why don't you go talk to them? Because they're thinking the same thing. I'm just trying to love you guys. I'm a good pastor. Can I get an amen? But sometimes, sometimes our children need a little push to get them going. Sometimes our children need a little push to make their bed. Sometimes they need a little push to brush their teeth. Can I get an amen? Guys, it's not an option. They got to brush their teeth and take a shower. Amen? We ain't, we ain't going a week without teeth brushing and, and, and showers being given. And so I want to encourage you. If you're not brushing your teeth by serving and if you're not taking a shower by serving, I would encourage you. Because what happens is it's an opportunity. And it's not, it's not a need. It's an opportunity. Everything that we have here is an opportunity. The reason why we put a parking lot team, the reason why we have greeters outside, the reason why we have a handout is for you guys. And so you guys have an opportunity now to give back to the kingdom and sow and bless somebody else. Can I get an amen? Now, I would encourage you. In the handout, was there an orange sheet? I don't know if they put it in there this week. I do not remember. Dream Team sheet, if that is you and you have not connected, I don't want you going somewhere where you don't believe you're called. And if you have any questions about all of those areas on that sheet, come talk to me or go talk to Tim. And we are going to walk you through as best as we possibly can to be able to get you connected where you're called where you're called, because I don't want someone in a place where they're not called. And I'm not talking about your preference. There's a difference between calling and preference, and that's something that I have to teach you, and that's something we need to understand. If you're naturally introverted, your preference is not going to be the one on center stage talking. And I know it sounds weird, but I've been doing this for four years, but if you knew me before this, I did not want to get up and talk to people. I did not. I bombed, absolutely bombed my effective speaking class, the one college class I took. It was horrible. I did a cooking demonstration. Y'all, I can't cook. Why did I do a cooking demonstration? But you know what? It is not my preference, but it was my calling. If your preference isn't to work with children, but it may be your calling, maybe you're really good at it, maybe God is calling you into that area. But I want you to read over that and sign up for something to serve because we give you the opportunity to be able to do that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word that we have to go forth today, and I thank you for the word that we're about to speak. And Father, may it be seed into our hearts, and our hearts be tilled in good ground to be able to receive your word, and not only just hear it, but be doers of it. Allow it to be planted in the hearts of our soul, and God, may it produce great fruit in this life. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my words to be as sweet as honey, and Father, we would be able to understand what your word has to say about soul detox. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, I normally have a joke, but I, uh, I messed up. I didn't get a joke ready for you today. But we're going to dive right into this little series that we've been entitling Soul Detox. Can I get an amen that we all need a soul detox? Amen. Every one of us. We talked about it last week, and I wasn't trying to hit on anybody or hurt anybody, but we were talking about our body. Most of the time, we need to detox in our natural body. Because if we drink too much coffee, if we drink too much soda, it will store up toxins in our body because coffee is very acidic. If you're having acid reflux and different problems like that, maybe you need to cut out and detox yourself from the acidic drinks, maybe orange juice, maybe coffee, maybe it's sugary stuff, maybe it is that stuff, and that detox will heal the problem that you're having. It's not you need to go on another medication, you need to take yourself off of the caffeination medication. Can I get an amen? Those are different things. And the same thing with, with our lives, and when we talk about our, our bodies, even the fat cells in our body store, that's the part, or part of your body that stores toxins. And I talked to you about it last week as the same way that the fat cells in your body store toxins in your body. That's the same way that your bad thought patterns and your bad thoughts store toxins in your soul. And what we need to understand is the same toxins that affect our body, we have the same toxins in our soul that are affecting the way that we look at what God wants us to do. Those toxins in your soul that will look at something and you will be the kind of person that always sees the negative rather than the positive in something. And we all know those type of people. And if you don't know anybody, you're that kind of person. We all need to understand that a soul detox is extremely important and God wills for us to be detoxed in our soul. Third John 2 says, beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in good health. We all love that part, right? We all want to prosper and be in good health. God wants to process our, us to pro, um, <laughs> prosper physically, emotionally, financially, but we forget the last part about that verse that says, even as your soul prospers. And guys, if you want to be prosperous in every area of your life, you need to start, number one, with your soul. And I talked to you about it last week according to Second or 1 Thessalonians 5.23. It says, I sanctify yourself. Paul is writing to the church and says, sanctify your whole self, spirit, 
soul, and body. Guys, we are a spirit. We possess a soul, and we live in a body. And this is all just review to get us caught up and up to speed so we can dive into what we're going to detox today. We need to understand you are a spirit, and your soul consists of your mind, your will, and your emotions. So the emotions that you're feeling, they are not you. Those thoughts that you are thinking, they are not you. You need to possess them and tell them to go where they need to go. If they're not good thoughts, you tell them to get out in Jesus' name. If they're not good things that you're doing, you need to tell them to get out in Jesus' name. But the, the, the number one thing that you need to understand is you are a spirit. According to Ephesians 1, it says that you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. If you've given your life to Jesus, guys, you are righteous and truly holy. Just as Jesus is, so are you in this world. Amen? You need to understand that. And the first step that you need to understand is the spiritual aspect of it. Because if you're going to walk through this life based on your soul, you are going to be defeated every single day. You're going to have a temptation. To have, you're going to have a really good day. How many of us have had a really good day? Like nothing can come against you. No weapon formed against me will prosper, but then all of a sudden, 9 o'clock at night, something does, and it ruins the whole thing. You're going to have those temptations. If you're going to walk by your emotions and walk by your feelings, they will lie to you in time. Can I get an amen? Can I tell you this much? And I know I've said this before, but I want to reiterate it because I feel we need to hit this on the head. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That is not an emotion. That is not a goosebump. That is a spiritual truth that we need to remind ourselves. You know what the Lord spoke to me? Uh, I believe it was this morning. It was the last night of this morning. I can't remember. Everything winds up all together. Because I was milling through something in my mind. Whether somebody had done something, and I am thinking about this in my mind, and what it does is it releases toxins. So now I'm not thinking about this person and seeing them as they truly are, righteous and truly holy. I'm allowing these thoughts to release toxin to my soul to say, why did this person do this? Do they realize what they truly just did? Do they realize the amount of pressure it just put on us? Do you realize? And what happened is I spoke to the Lord and said, Lord, why is this going on? You know what he spoke to me? Because you're not thinking about me. You're not thinking about me. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord in my strength. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So the number one part of our soul detox is to understand that we are a spirit. We are righteous and truly holy, sanctified. We are the head and not the tail. We are above and not beneath, and we are behind in no good thing. God wills for us to prosper, and we need to believe that. But do you believe it? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Are you experiencing death and always thinking of the negative? Are you experiencing anxiety? And depression, that's a big one nowadays. Every, do, you, do you know what? Ever since they put a name to something, it kind of grabs people. You want to know why? Because when you name something, it has, a, it has a substance to it. But when you understand that there's substance to the name of Jesus, the name above all names, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? They has to. Anxiety needs to bow to the name of Jesus. Anxiety is an emotion that you feel that is a lie. Your circumstances might point to the prop, might point to giving you anxious thoughts, anxious things, but when you focus your mind on the anxiety, that's exactly what the devil wants to do. It'll release toxins in your soul, which will release more anxiety. And now you're anxious about thinking. You're anxious about waking. You're anxious about driving in a car. You're anxious about breathing because you never know when it's going to be your last breath. And it will cripple you to the point to where you can't look anywhere. But my thought to you today is when we are on our back, that's when we can look up. When we are weak, that's when he is strong, church. Can I get an amen? Some of my greatest messages that I have preached are in the moments that I didn't want to get up here. Some of the greatest times that I saw the greatest impact of my life is at the times where I did not want to get out of bed. They're the times where I came into church not because I wanted to, because I was called to. Not, I didn't go to work because I wanted to. I came to work because that's what God called me to do. And you might not be a pastor, and you might not be a, a, a full-time ministry in church. You may not be a worship leader, but you've got a ministry at your job to do. You've got a job to do where you are called. Whether you're in nursing, whether you're in hospitality, whether you're in HR, whether you're a waiter, whether you're in construction, whether you're in manufacturing, I don't care who you are, you need to get your mind 
mind screwed on straight, detox that thing and know that you are there for a purpose, on purpose to fulfill the will of God in your life. And I know this sounds like a really good pump-up speech, and you guys aren't responding the way I want you to respond, but you know what? I don't care, because I'm here to preach a message whether you are listening or not. Amen? I came to give you something whether you're ready to receive or not. That's the mind that we need to have. And I'm sorry I'm screaming, but I'm excited. This is extremely important in our life, because you know what? I have to preach myself happy. I have to, pre- I have to preach myself happy. Because when you've got people dropping out, running away from you and saying stuff and making you feel bad, you got to preach yourself happy. When I preach to you, I I may not feel good. When you preach to someone, you may not be ready. But I know the word of God that says be instant in and out of season. You may not want to, but when God says raise up that cross and follow me, I'm going to pick it up and run, Jesus. I'm going for what you call me to do. Last week we talked about, and I'm going to knock over the mic stand here. Last week we talked about the restless soul. And can I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be, this, that's me. Because I've got ADHD. I'm, I've got a gift. Attention, hyperactive, everything. I am just, pew, 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 I'm running, okay? But it's a gift. I don't look at it as a disorder. I look at it as a gift. I can get a lot of things done but accomplish nothing. I am gifted, all right? <laughs> Woo! Look how he said. <laughs> but it's the restless soul. But we talked about the curse of the restless soul. There's a curse att- attached to it. And, and if you didn't hear the message, go back to it. And I don't really have too much time, so I'm going to run. I'm going to run. Everybody ready? You want to run with me? I'll be ready. Come on, give it up to Jesus because he is worthy. Amen? Come on. This week we're going to talk to you about the heavy soul. And exactly what I said in the beginning, last week we talked about the restless soul, that I was searching for something to fulfill you, but it never does until you found the only thing that was created to fulfill you, and that is Jesus. You know what else that I was thinking about this week? About Christianity? And about how, why, I was asking God, why are so many Christians depressed and anxious? And I'm not attacking anybody. I've experienced it myself. But I said, God, why? Why are we so anxious Why are we so depressed? And, of course, you can get all religious and say, well, the Satan has come down and he knows his time is near. But, again, you're focusing on Satan. Do you want to know what he told me? And I don't want to get super religious on you or spiritual on you. You don't want to know what he told me? He says, because people have forgotten the simplicity of the gospel. They're looking for the next best thing. They're looking for the next step. How do I get become a better Christian, a better Christian, but yet they forget that Jesus was right here the whole time. We forget that when we're, because we, we get this cliche almost when you hear it, that we're righteous and truly holy. It's cliche almost to think that you are the righteousness of God. You've heard it so many times. It's by grace I have been saved through the blood of Jesus. But yet we forget the importance and the power of it. Guys, if you're trying to pursue the mountaintop, but yet tripping over a speed bump, it's time to go back to the basics. Because so many times we get caught up in all the stuff, we forget about the one who lives in us. We get stuck on the things we have to do rather than we look at what has already been done. And I'm preaching good. If you're listening, can I get an amen? This week we're going to be talking about the heavy soul, the anxious soul. The depressed soul. The soul that means that you, 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 you may be 80 pounds soaking wet, but yet you have a heaviness on your soul and you can't get out of bed. I can tell there's probably a few of those in here and a few of those watching online. Because the heaviness of this message needs to understand that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. No anxiety, no heavy soul, no nothing. But now we, we have a generation of people that are raised on low-grade depression. It's not clinically deep. It's not deep. But we have this thing that says nothing's horribly wrong, but nothing is right either. That was good. And then here in Psalm 42, 5, it says this. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why? Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Right there, cut it off. We only wanted verse 5 there. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why? You see the psalmist right there, it's not Psalm David. It's not King David. He, he didn't write this thing. 
But it's a question that was portrayed. Why are you downcast, O my soul? So he was separating whoever wrote this. He was writing a song saying, why are you downcast, O my soul? So what you need to do is you need to separate. The heaviness in your soul is not who you are. You need to separate. You know the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. You need to cut your anxiety between you and God and say, you can just go into the trash and I'm going to worship Jesus. Amen? you need to ask the questions why ask your soul you wake up in the morning and you just get up and you're like why do I feel so bad like what's going on here you need to ask yourself why are you downcast oh my soul and why are you so heavy within me and now the question I'm going to ask you is why are our souls heavy why are they heavy why in our lives do we experience so much heaviness that we don't know what and where it comes from well the number one thing that I'm going to bring to you is heavy hearts you're heavy with hurts from the past That's number one. You're heavy with hurts from the past. (laughs) Lamentations 3.19 says this. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness of the goal. I will remember them and my soul is downcast within me. You're remembering the hurts that someone did to you 20 years ago and you're still letting it hurt you today. You're looking back on your past mistakes and allowing those to dictate how you feel today. You're allowing the issues that happened two weeks ago that have been dealt with, and you're still milling them over in your mind. Have you ever reconciled with somebody, somebody, but yet you get done and you're like, I wonder if they were really true? Did they really submit and did they really repent wholeheartedly? And what that does is that releases even more toxins. That does. I'm hitting a a deep vein right now. I really am. Because what that does is when you get and you repent with somebody, And they repent back to you. And you guys reconcile that relationship. And then all of a sudden, who comes in to steal, kill, and destroy? The thief. And you go away and you walk away and you say, oh, I wonder if they were really true. And then when you start that, you start a process of thinking in your mind, oh, wait a minute. This is what they did. I don't think that they're true. I don't think. And then all of a sudden, you're right back to the toxic thoughts that you had. And that person becomes a demon rather than your Christian brother or sister, right? We need to understand Satan's weapons of his warfare because he doesn't war after your spirit. Your spirit is already sealed. He's warring after your soul and after your body, right? The weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. They are mighty even to the pulling down of strongholds. And so we need to understand that our soul is a target for the devil to come after. But you know what? You need to say, Satan, this is holy ground. Can't touch us. This is holy ground. We, we have the issues where we look back in the past and you've got a problem. You know what? You need to understand this. Don't go looking for a problem. I'm, I'm going to get real with you real quick. And I know some of you may not agree with this, but you know what? You need to pray about it. And when we get to heaven, you'll find out that I'm right. And we'll go on in Jesus' name, all right? But if we, if we disagree on this, I want you to pray about it because I'll pray about it too. What I want you to pray about is the heaviness of the hurts of the past. Psychology in the world will teach you to try and dig up dry old bones to try and figure out if that's the problem. A psychologist will have you sit down and they'll ask you questions about your past. Well, how was your relationship with this? And how was this? And then all of a sudden, if they hit a nerve, then all of a sudden they're stirring up stuff that you didn't even know was down there. And all of a sudden, the devil can use that and use it in your life and say, well, there was a problem over here, so maybe there's a problem over here, and maybe there's a problem over here, and maybe there's another problem over here. When I was four years old, I didn't say, I didn't tell my mom I stole that cookie out of the cookie jar. And all it does, it gets you pointed at the problem. What you need to do is look to Jesus. Because your answer is not in the past. The answer is in the cross. The answer is not in your past. It's in his past. And we need to realize that. You don't need to be looking for that uncle that hurts you. Or that dad that hurts you. Or that one that rejected you. You need to look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter and the finisher of your faith to heal you. Can I get an amen? And then if, if the Lord, and this is the thing, you need to focus on Jesus. You need to focus on Jesus. But there are times that the Holy Spirit will bring back to your remembrance some things that you need to fix. Because maybe you were the problem and not them. Or maybe God wants you to repent even if you were right and they were wrong. So my, my charge to you is this. Seek the Lord first, and if he reminds you about something in your past, you need to either repent or forgive or all of the above. Can I get an amen, church? 
you can't remember what your pain is from, cry out to Jesus and ask for wisdom. And if he'll give it to you, he'll reveal the problem to you. That even goes all the way back to church hurt. Now, we live in a small town, USA. I know a lot of us have come from different churches, different backgrounds, different denominations, different things. And we've had people in our life that have hurt us. And when it responds to, if it's a church person that hurts you, what will happen is Satan will get you to say all church people are bad. Or if it's a guy that molested you or hurt you, all guys are bad. Or if it was a girl who did this to you, then all girls are bad. What happens is the devil will try and persuade you and see that a past hurt and create a stronghold in your life that you can't walk out of. I'm hitting some deep stuff here today, and I'm going to get some responses by the end of the day. But what happens is church hurt. This is what I've seen with different people that have been hurt by churches. They put up walls in their life because they have sold out to a church, blessed a church, and then all of a sudden that church turned on them and cut them off. And what that does is that makes that person extremely judgmental, and those walls are built so when they go into another church, they're not able to break the walls down so that way someone can speak into their life and love them. Because we all have blind spots. Say, I've got one. And we all may not like the blind spots that we have. But when it comes to church hurts, you need to forgive and let it go. That doesn't mean you need to forget it, but you need to forgive them from what happened. You need to forgive them. Because I don't want Christians running around judgmental and pointing out people's problems. I hate that. I really do. If someone comes up to me and tries to say, well, why didn't this person do it this way? I say, I don't know. Go talk to him, not me. I hate that. I hate gossip when people come up and say, well, why didn't you? You know what? I I love you guys. I really do, but as a pastor, you get a lot of people that come to you with gossip. And as a church, you will have people that come to you in gossip. And what I teach you in Jumpstart Track, what I'm going to teach you in Jumpstart Track today, if you come to Jumpstart Track today, you have a job to squash that gossip and that backbiting right where it is and not let it go any further. It's not just my job. It's all of our job. Amen? And we need that. We need to let it go. Whether you lost your job because someone stole it from you, a friend hurt you, you th- maybe you're, hmm, this is a big one, maybe You can't forgive God because someone that you love passed away. Maybe you didn't get the promotion that you wanted, and it was the promotion that was going to seal the deal with you and your family and the track that you've been planning for for 20 years. And some brown noser person who just started six months ago got it before you. Who are you going to let dictate your life? Your soul or your spirit? Even Jesus said, My spirit is willing but my flesh is weak. When he was sweating great great drops of blood, that's what he said. So why are our souls heavy? They're heavy from hurts from the past. And number two, they're heavy from the trouble in the present. They're heavy from the trouble in in the present. Luke, I want you to take notes and write this down. Luke 12, 22 and 31. I don't have time to read the whole thing, but I will read you this. In verse 24 of Luke 12, it says this, Look at the ravens, for they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, but God feeds them, and you are far more valuable than him, ah, than any birds. Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? I know it's cliche. I know we have heard it. But are we really walking in it? I know this is extremely simple in the points that I'm making. But we need to understand that the complexity of our soul can be fixed by one name, and that is Jesus. I'm not going to dig down into your past to try and have you you repent of everything or have you forgive everything or have you run to all of your problems to let them and set them free. Because there are things in your life you need to repent of. But you need to focus on Jesus. We're not going to look for demons under every doorknob. We're not going to look for every problem in your heart. We're going to look for Jesus. And in time, he will reveal something to you. And here's a little thing when you're helping somebody walk through with a heavy soul. If you can see their blind spot, maybe it's time for you to not say something and let God reveal it to them. Don't come out and say, well, you have a horrible problem with judgment. We've all done that maybe. I don't know. Maybe not me. I don't know. But we need to have them walk them through that and allow God to speak that to them. And so why are we heavy? We're heavy from troubles in the present. Maybe you're stuck in your marriage. Maybe all those other things. Number three, you're heavy with anxiety about the future. You're heavy with anxiety about the future. Maybe 
you've got a job that you don't know how long you're going to last before they let your job go. And you're the breadwinner of the family. Maybe you're a mom, and this is a big one. You're fear in fear of what your children. You try and shelter them as much as you possibly can. You don't let them go play on the monkey bars because they may break their arm or their leg. Or you don't let them actually get three feet in front of you because they're, you're, they're worried that they're going to fall and fall on a cactus or something. Like, I don't know that maybe that sewer vent is going to open up and they're going to fall in and maybe it, whatever that clown is going to grab them. I don't know what it may be. But we have anxiety about everything, and there's a potential for anxiety about everything that we do. But anxiety is the biggest thing that the devil is using to cripple us. And what anxiety does, all it is, is a distractant. You know how we have these repellents to repel mosquitoes and all that? You need to use the Holy Spirit in Jesus and just be the repellent and have those mosquitoes of anxiety get off of you in Jesus' name. You need to use it. You need to keep repeating the joy of the Lord is my strength. I may not feel it right now, but I am the righteousness of God. And you need to say it enough to make yourself believe it. You need to do those types of things. You need to. And we're heavy about the anxiety about the future, your job. Your debt may be growing. Or you, you may not be able to get out of debt as quick as you want. Or you may be in your 60s and you're still $150,000 in debt and you're never going to get there. So you're like, what, whatever. You may have all this anxiety about all this stuff. Your retirement, whatever it may be. Jesus said, cast all of your cares on him because he cares for you. And I'm going to bring you to a scripture. Back to Psalm 42. And I'm going to read you 5 and 6. Remember when we said, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? The next part of that verse is extremely important. Because first he poses a question. And then the next point, he poses the solution. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Then he tells himself, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Amen, church? It is a choice that we have to make. It is a choice that we need to make every day. We get up in the morning, we have those anxious thoughts. We go to bed, we have those anxious thoughts. Yet, I will praise him, my Lord and my God. It is a choice that we make to tell our soul what to do. Because if you let your soul take the wheel, you are going to have a whole lot of train wrecks. Can I get an amen? We need to. And that's the biggest thing that I deal with. Helping people walk through that. Getting them to put their focus back on Jesus. Because even with teenagers... Yo, your teenagers have some questions, guys. They really, really do. This last weekend, it was so much fun. We, uh, we hosted the, uh, our youth group at our house. And what I did was I had everybody privately write down a question on a piece of paper. And then we opened them up. And then we read them. And we tried to answer them as a discussion. And they had some deep Deep question. They weren't asking, how am I going to get through college? They weren't asking, how am I going to get my first card? They were asking questions like, why did God make me the way he made me? Can I get an amen? Those are some deep, heavy soul questions. And those are questions that need to be answered. Those are questions that need to, we need to look at. Why did God make me? And we get so stuck in why are you downcast, oh, my soul? And in teenagers, why am I not the popular one? Why are people teasing me? Why are people coming against me? Why am I not skinny like that lady on the Cosmopolitan magazine? Why is my wife not having, you know, relationships with me? I'm going to leave that one right there. Why isn't my husband loving me? Why, 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 why? And we're looking at all the problems thinking that if we focus on the problem, eventually it's going to get fixed. Can I give you something? Are you ready for something? The definition of insanity is to do the same thing, expect different results. Maybe change your thought patterns and let God work. Amen? And so in here, he has put your hope in God. He's asking the question, why are you downcast? And he said, I don't care if you're downcast. I'm going to put my hope in God. So there's some things in your life you need to tell your soul. There are certain things in your life you need to tell your soul. And number one, you need to tell your soul to remember God's faithfulness in the past. He was there for me last time I needed money. He was there for me last time my marriage was in crisis. He was there for me last time when I was stuck on the side of the road with no gas and a guy like Chris comes up and fills my tank so I can get where I need to go. God has been faithful in the past, and that way I know he has got my back in Jesus' name. Amen? Back to Lamentations, and this is the best part about these scriptures. It says, I remember my afflictions. I remember my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. You know, all that bitterness that comes in and tries to rob you of your joy, rob you of your strength, all that bitterness. And I will remember them, and my soul is downcast with me. You know what? He's writing something. I'm going to remember them, but my soul is downcast anyway. Does that sound like a victim mentality? We just talked about it two weeks ago. 
We need to be a victim or a victor, not a victim. The apostle Peter, read 1 Peter 1. Read 1 Peter 1. Because Peter knew the way he was going to die. Jesus told him how he was going to die. And it wasn't going to be good. But yet Jesus, Peter was the greatest spokesman on the day of Pentecost. Peter was persecuted. Peter was abandoned. Peter was just everything. But yet in 1 Peter 1, he writes that all of these afflictions were there. But you know what? My God is bigger. I am a victor, not a victim. Amen? I am a victor. And it says this, and my soul is downcast within me. And then it says, it goes on, yet. Everybody say, yet. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of my Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, Lord God. Amen? You want to know what my favorite scripture is? And I'm spitting now. So that's why no one sits in the front row anymore. You want to know what my favorite scripture is? And I'm, I'm, I am lost on where it is. I know it's in Psalm. I think it's 39, but if it's wrong, don't, don't Google me, all right? Just, just whatever. It says, there may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. That is a promise, church. And if you will get that in your mind and your soul, you'll be okay. So you need to remember God's faithfulness in the past. Have you ever been short on cash, but yet the rent was due? But God saw you through? You know why I don't worry about money anymore? Because God has seen me through Many times. More times than I can count. And I've gotten real with God. I've yelled at him. I said, Lord Jesus, why? I thought I was supposed to be blessed. Can I tell you something? I don't preach a gospel that says, come to Jesus and all your problems go away. <laughs> you want to know what happens? Wendell Parr said this yesterday. He says, when you come to Jesus, that's when all your problems are really going to start. Amen. For all the Christians who have been Christians in a while, you know what I mean. We have multiple people who started coming to church here, and they said that they hadn't gone to church in months, and all of a sudden they start coming here, and the car breaks down. That demon on your water pump just went boom. I don't know what happened. You want to know why? Because the devil hates it when you worship God, and he'll do everything that he possibly can to keep you from worshiping him because the devil knows he's a defeated foe, and when you find out who you are in Christ and you are the victor in Jesus' name, he wants to steal that seed that was sown in your heart so you do not multiply. But church, we have a kingdom that the gates of hell cannot come against. We've got Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And so we need to remember his faithfulness. And number two, we need to cry out to God in the present. If you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling down about stuff that you're still dealing with, if you've got issues in your soul, and we're going to talk about this in the next coming weeks, whether it's lust, whether it's, um, whether it's uh, robbing, whether, whether it's any of that, lying, cheating, whether it's about self-medication, any, any types of those things. We're going to be talking about that next week. Everybody say it's next week. So come to church next week, and I'll beat, a, be, beat you up then. All right, it's all good. So cry out to God in the present. Jeremiah 33.3 is, call unto me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things that you do not know. It is so important for us to cry out to him because in that moment when God spoke to me this morning and said that people have lost the simplicity of the gospel, that is what I needed in that moment because it's when we cry out to him, that is when he can answer us. And third and final, trust in God's power and provision for your future. You see, you've got all these anxieties about your past problems, your present problems, and your future anxieties about what's going to happen. What we need to do is do the opposite of fear, and we need to trust in God's power and God's provision. Amy, you can come up and start playing. In 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, it says this, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to him, for he cares for you. Now, church, doesn't that sound pretty? Doesn't that sound awesome? You know, physically, it's, it's really easy to give your care to somebody else because you can just drop it, right? Or if you've got a heavy weight that you're carrying, and I don't have any weights up here, but if you're carrying a heavy weight physically, I can just walk over to Kevin and say, Kevin, take this, and I can drop it on him. And it's really easy to do that. But how do we do that in our soul? How? How do we take the problems in our life and put them in perspective so that way we can say, Jesus, here you go. How do we do that? Because I'm not going to tell you what you need to do. I'm going to tell you what you need to do and how you can do it. Let's all stand and close our eyes and bow our heads. This is something the Lord taught me. 
from a mentor. Everybody say, you need a mentor. I'm going to invite my worship team back up. But with every eye closed and every head bowed, I want you to have your eyes closed and head bowed because I do not want you to get distracted from this. Because this is probably one of the most important things that I am going to teach you today about the heavy soul. Because our lives get so distracted and so full of the problems and so full of the heaviness of life itself. And we get so overwhelmed and so heavy, we don't know what to do. We don't know who to run to. And yes, we're good little Christians. We know we need to cast our cares on the Lord, but how do we do it? But before I give you an answer, I'm going to tell you the next step that you can take today. Number one, when your soul feels down, you need to tell it to look up. You need to tell your soul, just like the rudder on a ship, you don't go from east to west letting the wind just take you. You need to use that rudder and steer it to where you want to go. Your soul is your rudder. Tell it where you want to go. You may be feeling pain right now, but you need to tell it the joy of the Lord is our strength. And you may need to keep teaching you to do that for a week for two weeks, for a month, but eventually when you get a discipline to tell your soul to look up, it will automatically look up because it knows that when God is for me, nothing can be against me. The next thing is you need to remember God's faithfulness. Remember, do not forget what God has brought you from. You may not be perfect now, but you're a lot better than what you used to be. Remember God's faithfulness. The next one is cry out to God cry out to him. Everybody say this. My soul longs for you, Lord Jesus. Next thing is you need to trust in him. Those are our next steps. Those are the next steps you need to take. For everybody watching online, keep your eyes closed and every head bowed. I'm speaking to your heart, not to your eyes, your heart. You need to tell your soul to look up. Look up. You may be staring at your phone right now online. You may be staring at your laptop right now. You may be wondering how you're going to get through the rest of your day. What I'm telling you to do is tell yourself to look up. I can't be the preacher that's in your ears every year, every day. You've got to allow Jesus, the greatest preacher of all, to bring you up. And you need to tell it where to go. Tell those thoughts where to go. Now we're back to how. Give all your worries and your cares to God, for he cares for you. Cast all of your cares on him, for he cares for you. What you need to realize is this. If God has called you to do something, he will give you the strength to do it. And for him to give you the strength, he will give you the wisdom. What you need to do is change your perspective on that problem. You need to realize that that wife or that spouse or that debt problem or that child that is running away or that problem at your job, you need to realize that it is not your problem. It is God's problem. It is not your problem to make somebody change. It is God's problem to make them change. So as as a church, I want us to say this out loud and say, God, you have a problem. All I'm dealing with right now, it's your problem. In Jesus' name. Like I said, that spouse that you've been trying to change for five years, what you need to say is, God, so-and-so is your problem, not mine. This car that I'm driving right now is not my problem. It is your problem. And when you release the ownership of that problem, you will release the weight of that problem. When you cast that care, speak life into it. Say, God, it is your problem. God, it is your problem. Now I want us to church. Let's say it one more time. God, it's your problem. And now I want to say you something by faith and say, devil, you've even got a bigger problem now. My problem is his problem. Now you've got a bigger one. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that hope will rise this morning. That hope will rise on the inside of us to say no to those problems. No to those thoughts. No to those emotions. No to those anxieties. And cast all of our care by saying this anxiety, God, is not mine. And every day I am going to release it to you. Every time I'm tempted to have an anxious feeling, I say, God, it is your problem. You are the one that is my healer. You are the one that is my 
provider. You are the one that is there for me in times when I am down. And it is you that is going to get me out of this. Holy Spirit, rise up within me right now in Jesus' name. For we give the problem to you in Jesus' name. And we know you are able to complete it and finish it even to the day of Jesus Christ. And it's his name that we pray. And everybody said...